Okay, today we're starting our unit on interpersonal communication theories. Have you ever thought about what it is that causes us to set interpersonal communication apart as a separate category from organizational, from mass communication, uh, from some of the other areas that we've studied? We've spent a lot of time talk talking about meaning theories, thinking theories, uh, but all of that that we've primarily what we've covered so far has been an intrapersonal process. What's going on in the mind of the individual person who's receiving that message or who is creating a message and trying to get that meaning established uh, with the receiver. Well, when we talk about interpersonal communication, we're usually talking about two or three people who are face to face who are exchanging messages. And that's different from a small group where we have at least four or five people and sometimes 15 or 20. These people understand that they're in relationship to each other, so we say that they're interdependent, that they're interlocked. But they recognize that they're having a conversation out in the hallway. They're having a conversation on the telephone. Uh, so not all interpersonal communication is face-to-face. -face. There may be phone conversations. Uh, some email is very interpersonal. Other email, of course, is junk and belongs in the trash can immediately. Uh, but most of the time, it is face-to-face, -face, and certainly in the studies of interpersonal that have been done, uh, those studies have been done 99.9% .9 in face-to-face -face type context. Uh, we're going to discover an important part of interpersonal communication is rules theory. And when Dr. Williamson is with you in her next lecture, she'll be talking with you about rules theory, particularly Shime, Susan Shimanoff's theory, and making applications of that to uh, marital typologies. A lot of her research and doctoral dissertation was done in what's called relational communication and was done in, in those studies. So we'll be coming to that. And remember back when we talked about the different perspectives, we talked about the laws perspective, those uh, basic universal kinds of rules uh, like people assign causes for systematic, for hey, people assign causes for behavior systematically. And that's a, a premise out of attribution theory. Well, it's a law that people use and break communication rules. Now, the rules themselves have the status of rules theory because they're going to change from one context to another. Uh, we'll see more of that as we go along. Uh, and, and you can think about maybe what are some of the rules that you use, what are some that, that you don't use. How do those rules and other behaviors and messages that you deliver affect other people's outcomes. Have you ever thought about what it is people do when they want you to do something? Or what do you do when you want someone else to behave in a particular way? Well, we'll come to what's called compliance gaining strategies. And those are, that's one set of, of um, it's a taxonomy that, that lists some of the ways that people affect each other's outcomes. But the kinds of messages we construct, the persuasive strategies that we use, all of those are ways that we affect other people's outcomes. Okay, we reduce our uncertainty through these interpersonal exchanges. And we've talked a lot about information theory already. Uh, if you've kind of forgotten that part, you may want to go back to your study guide or you may want to pull up the PowerPoint again off of WebCT where we have all of these uh, presentations online and take a look at uh, bits and pieces and entropy and chaos and turbulence and, and how we reduce that uncertainty. But it's very often through interpersonal communication that we get the information we need in order to have an appropriate exchange to reduce our uncertainty. Uh, when the Great Flood occurred at the university, there was great uncertainty and all kinds of different media were being used in order to obtain that information and reduce uncertainty about when classes would start, how things would be done, and so on. Okay, we're going to see when we get to social exchange theory, we'll look at this again in even greater depth, but these exchanges have cost and rewards. 
Every time you stop in the hallway and talk to somebody or choose to go to a movie instead of study for your comm theory exam or you study for the exam instead of socializing with your friends, every time you do that, there's a trade-off that's involved. Well, there's some rules that are involved for appropriate exchanges and so on, and we'll be looking at those as well. Through self-disclosure, we learn about each other. Well, we come to understand who the other person is, and all of this involves a progression, uh, both through the number or quantity of exchanges that we have with the other person, as well as the number of shared topics. Uh, and, and then the depth of that topic plays into it as well. Um, think about the difference between the exchanges that you've had in this class with uh, people that I, I don't think anybody in this class is, is best friends with someone else. I could be wrong. But someone that, that you just know tangentially in, your, in one of your classes compared to uh, your best friend your parent, your spouse, if you have one, the people who are close to you and significant. And, and you'll easily recognize that uh, the people you're closer to, you talk about many, many more topics. You talk about those topics in much greater depth than you would with someone you hardly know. Uh, the, the level of intimacy is much greater. Uh, the level of trust has to be much greater. You have to trust this person not to use the information against you in some way. Now, think for a moment, is there any exception to that little set of rules that I just gave you about self-disclosure? And, and while you're thinking about that, let's kind of recap that self-disclosure is incremental. You do. Only a very over-disclosing, often socially inappropriate person uh, dumps everything out of the closet on the, you know, skeletons and all, on the first visit or first communication exchange. So normally it's incremental, it's turn-taking, you know, you take turns with the other person and, and share, and it takes into account the ability of the other person to handle that information. Now, do you think of an exception? Okay. The only one, or the, maybe not the only one, but the best one that I think of uh, involves when sometimes if you're flying cross country and you're seated beside a total stranger and you're going to San Francisco or New York for a visit and that person's returning home. So in other words, the likelihood of your seeing this person ever again in your whole lifetime, unless you make a concerted effort to locate one another, is very, very low. And when, when you're in that kind of a situation and you're sitting there bored and uh, not in a mood to sleep and so forth, that's when you may uh, engage in high disclosure to a total stranger. But that occurs because there's no risk. That person doesn't know you. Maybe all they know is your first name. Uh, there's no way that they're going to come back and tell people that you work with, let me tell you about and start disclosing information that in some way could be harmful to your uh, persona, to who you are. Okay, so those are some of the characteristics of... Uh, self-disclosure, that it involves trust, but it, because it involves risk, and, and those two go together, uh, and that it's incremental and it's reciprocal. Okay, so look at all of those things one more time, because this is always a good test question. Effective self-disclosure is reciprocal, incremental, and it takes into account the ability of the other person to handle that information. It involves risk, and therefore, it involves trust. Okay, uh, we're going to turn our attention next to social learning theory by Bandura. Uh, you've got his name and theory in your book as well. And this, this theory views people as capable of self-regulation through self-rewards and punishments. Now reflect for a minute. How do you reward yourself? Most of us are better at rewarding ourselves than we are at punishing ourselves. Okay, I mean, you know, why punish yourself if you don't have to? 
Okay, but what kinds of things do we do and why do we engage in those behaviors? You know, some people uh, reward themselves with food. Some people uh, reward themselves with the, you know, the, I'm sure the ladies all join me in, in acknowledging the, good val- the value of a good trip to the mall. Uh, and, and we've all got ways that we do this as a way of reinforcing ourselves for a particular behavior. I studied for three hours, therefore I should be able to do such and such. Uh, but we also sometimes engage in punishments as well. I have to admit I'm not as good at the punishment phase as uh, perhaps some of you may be. But anyway, there are four stages that people go through when they're engaging in social learning. Or, and, and we could call them stages. We might even call them dimensions. I'm not sure that, that we always go through all four of these in order. But there's an information acquisition stage. You're not going to learn anything without acquiring new information. That, that's kind of a circular definition there. But uh, in order to engage in learning, that means that you're acquiring some no, new information. That information is somehow being shared with you. Okay, it may be through reading, it may be through interpersonal communication, you know, there are all kinds of places that you can get information. A lot of what we learn socially is through our direct experience, uh, the, the social exchanges that we have with other individuals. You talk too much at the cocktail party, the pizza party, and the people just kind of drift away from you. Well, hopefully you've learned that they were bored and they'd rather go listen to someone else, and so they've just kind of made their excuses and departed uh, from you. Uh, Sometimes we engage in role-playing, and and we learn through that. Uh, Perhaps you've had theories, uh, not theories, classes around campus that ask you to play different uh, roles, Uh, maybe a a managerial training class, and you you play the role of the superior, the role of subordinate, Maybe there were sexual harassment exercises or uh, maybe in your business communication class you did some role playing that related to interviews, to job interviews or exit interviews or appraisal interviews. And you took turns being the interviewee and the interviewer. And by wearing those different hats and having to think through what that person would say Uh, what kind of behaviors and communication behaviors they would engage in, you're learning to take the perspective of that individual. And when we get to laying and perspectives, we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, But through role-playing, you learn a great deal. Uh, I can remember a three-year-old who was in my life years ago uh, was down on the floor wiggling and going pssss and making these interesting little noises. And I said, what are you doing, Kelly? And he said, I'm a piece of bacon. I'm in the frying pan, and it's really hot, and I have to keep moving so I don't get burned up. Well, most of us don't need to role play uh, a piece of bacon <laughs> in order to understand what bacon is. But but it makes the point that our ability to establish empathy, our ability to understand the point of view of other people is particularly important. And then modeling is a fourth dimension of that, that once we have learned these behaviors, then we're in a position to be a model to show other people how to do that, whether it's an actor teaching others to act, whether... Uh, it's a musician teaching others to perform, whether it's a manager training trainees, uh, whether it's a teacher teaching student teachers, you know, the, it, it goes on and on. But even as we're engaged in the modeling behavior, we're, we're still learning as well how to be the role model, how to uh, exhibit that behavior. Uh, sometimes uh, you may be told, you know, you may be afraid of a situation, and they say, well, just go in there and fake it. You know, act like you know what you're doing, whether you do or not. And and that's one spin on this idea of modeling, that we just go in there and, and try it and go for it uh, as it is. <clears throat> but Bandura's social learning theory has been very influential in explaining how people learn and how they change their behaviors and how they reinforce themselves 
and so forth. But we are capable of learning, and that's an encouraging thing when you're at those points that you think your brain really may not be able to absorb anything else. Okay, we're going to turn next to what's called uncertainty reduction theory. This is Berger and Calabrese. And this is the application of that same information theory that we had early in the semester. Okay, but this time we're recognizing the application of that theory to the interpersonal context. And this is a very powerful communication theory. It's one of the best ones that we have. Uh, because it operates across all communication contexts. It doesn't matter whether it's an in, interpersonal, as we're going to be talking about in the next few minutes, or whether it's at the organizational corporate level, or whether it's at the societal level. You know, sometimes it's one country trying to determine whether another country has, in fact, launched a nuclear missile in their direction. Well, that's the seeking of information in order to reduce uncertainty. Uh, at the corporate level, uh, during the university's big flood, uh, there was all kinds of information seeking. How many buildings are flooded? How much were they flooded? How extensive is the damage? What are we going to do about that? And, and lots of information flowing uh, for quite a while. None of it was very good uh, because nobody had enough information to put good information, useful information, out there into the network. When we get to organizational communication, we'll see that even more, how there's, there's absolute information, all that there is available, and there's distributed information. But I don't want to get ahead of myself on that, except just to give you a preview that, that all of this stuff ties together. And it's a question of how you make the application that is most meaningful. Because people seek information in order to reduce uncertainty. They seek that information whether they are in interpersonal context. They seek that information whether they're in organizational context. They seek information even when they're in uh, small group situations. And we'll come to that material later on as well. Okay. We should also kind of put a footnote in, though, that people are capable of creating uncertainty. You know, while most of the time we're looking for information in order to reduce uncertainty, and remember under information theory we said bits of information cut in half the number of alternatives. Now, a bit of information will <clears throat> give you a lot more information in a hurry than a piece of information will. But people create uncertainty. They sometimes intentionally withhold information. What's going to be on the test? Will this be on the test? Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you up to a point what's going to be on the test, but I'm not going to give you a copy of the test, which this is not, by the way. Uh, I'm not going to give you a copy of the test because that's the only thing you would study, I suspect except those of you that are truly dedicated to the cause. So uh, we say, well, these units will be on there. This type of material will be on there. Uh, I'll create a certain degree of ambiguity uh, with the pure intention of making you study more than I'm going to ask you on the exam. But that's because you're supposed to learn, essentially, everything that we cover in the course. But I don't want to give five-hour exams that I have to grade all the way through, so we won't ask all of that on the exams. You know, some teachers will give you uh, 20 essay questions and say five of these will be on the exam. Well, when they do that, they're creating that degree of ambiguity. They're creating uncertainty on purpose. Okay, and that may be a little annoying, <laughs> you know, but that's the way it works. Uh, there are possible alternative behaviors and beliefs. That, you know, there are different things the teacher could do. Uh, stir into that causal attributions of the interactants, the people that are involved. All this premise is saying is that there are a lot of factors at work here. There are a number of things that are coming into play in this situation. The choices that the people have in the situation, the choices that they choose to give to you, uh, any other intervening variables that may be uh, beyond the control of the people who are involved. Now, Berger and Calabrese address uh, what happens in terms of information exchange when people meet each other. 
and they tell us that there's an entry phase. And think about the kind of information that you exchange when you first meet someone. Okay? Generally, that's demographic information. It's the real safe stuff. Uh, it's the information that has minimal consequences. <clears throat> Then we move to what they call an entry phase where there's actually an exchange, and it means the entry phase into a real relationship rather than just a superficial relationship. Uh, when we get to uh, Mark Knapp's theory, we'll, we'll take these three phases and give them five new labels and look at them in even more depth. Uh, but at the entry phase, according to Berger and Calabrese, uh, we're, we're moving uh, into at entry, where it's the demographic information. At the personal phase, we're moving into that information that requires some self-disclosure, some information about attitudes and feelings. And then finally, there's going to be an exit phase, and this is where the relationship is terminating. Uh, and when we get to Stephen Duck, we'll compare uh, what he has to say about why relationships dissolve. So this one just kind of gives us an overview, but we know there are lots of relationships that are terminated, uh, and these behaviors include uh, what's called leave-taking behavior. Uh, sometimes we just avoid people or ignore them, uh, but I've got the note, compare that to social exchange theory. Ignoring somebody may cost more than it's worth, or it may cost you the relationship, but sometimes that's okay. Uh, but in the exit phase, the, the relationship is being terminated. And sometimes this is because you move out of an apartment complex and move to a different location. Or you quit this job and move to a different job. Now, thinking about those three phases, we might reflect on, again on self-disclosure and why we're cautious in sharing that information with one another. Okay, I mean, we've already said it involves risk and so on. But, um, well, what I'm thinking is that if you're ever in a half-price bookstore, it may be the really old, old, worn-out paperback bookstore now, uh, there's a little paperback called Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Am? It was written by a fellow named John Powell. And he points out that we all need to protect ourselves. You know, you're all you've got. I'm all I've got. I mean, we have friends and all that. But, but our own self is very important to us. And we don't want people to dislike us. We don't want people to criticize us. And so it's a very vulnerable thing to share who we are with other people. And so we start very cautiously with that demographic information at the entry phase. And, and we proceed cautiously through things like the weather, uh, where you live, what part of the city you're in, where were you born, th those things that are safe to talk about. And then, if things seem to be going well, and that takes us all back into nonverbal behavior and all the cues that we pick up there as well, then we may move on into that more personal phase and risk disclosing some of our beliefs and values. But even then, we'll start with what we perceive as safer beliefs and values the kind of food we do or don't like, the kind of cars we do or don't like. Uh, unless the person is an avid sports fan, we may share our opinion about certain um, sports events or certain teams associated with those events. Usually, we're way down the line before we get to things like politics and religion because those, those have often the greatest potential for conflict and misunderstanding. Or oh, not misunderstanding, but differences. And so we want to be careful that we can trust the other person uh, when we get to that. And so we gain this information about each other. We get this knowledge about each other. And even though that knowledge may be imperfect, uh, that's all that we have to work on. And all the time we have what Berger calls communication plans. These are goal-driven, and they're our plan for what we're going to do to accomplish whatever it is we're trying to do next. Now, we're usually most conscious of that when we're going into something like a job interview. 
Okay, you know, you'll you'll practice, you'll rehearse questions in your head. What might the interviewer ask? How do I want to respond to those uh, those kinds of things? And you've got that plan all laid out. I want to be sure that I let them know about these career experiences that I had. I want to be sure that I let them know uh, I have these particular credentials, these computer skills, <clears throat> whatever may be pertinent to the situation. Well, when you do that, you're exhibiting your ability to develop uh, this communication plan. Um, if you want to meet this good-looking person on the other side of the room, do you have a plan to do that? You know, how, how and, <laughs> you know, we won't share people's favorite lines at bars and other places in here today, but, you know, you've, you've all heard certain pickup lines and some of you've engaged in those lines and some of you want to gag and die over some of them. But, but these are plans that people have used, you know, and, and some of these people, whether it's male or female, think they're being so cool, so suave, using this line on you. But, you know, if you've heard it before, and particularly if you've heard it frequently, it's of no interest to you. So uh, some of those communication plans, even though we've got them, aren't very good. If you're going to see your parents and hit them up for the keys to the car, our money for a particular event, you know. I always knew, most of you know, my girls are grown now and out on their own, which is a nice thing. Uh, but when they were teenagers, you know, you always knew there was that ulterior plan when, when they came into the kitchen or the dinner, wherever, and went, oh, mom, you're the sweetest, most wonderful mom in the whole wide world. Well, I know that's true, but my response to them would usually be, okay, what is it you want? You know, let's, let's cut through all this smarmy stuff. Let's cut through the grease, whatever metaphor you want. Uh, what, what are you trying to accomplish here? And so, uh, those plans often went awry, or sometimes they just got shortened. You know, just tell me what you want, and I'll tell you whether you can have it or not, but let's cut out all this intermediate stuff. So, um, uh, these are all kinds of things that we do in terms of these communication plans. Now, in order to create the messages to reduce these plans, then we have to uh, assemble in some way the message that we're going to create. Uh, this involves memory. This involves retrieval. This re involves utilization of the information. And these affect the, the person's ability to use scripts and to create novel utterances. You know, the, um, the shy person is going to have more trouble with their communication plan. They're going to be more limited in what they have available to them. Uh, the inexperienced person is going to have less information in their memory banks. They'll have fewer choices about what they can, can pull out of there. You know, uh, debaters, for example, our, our forensics team at U of H is always adept in a number of social issues. And they could just pull those topics out of their head and talk about them because they're, they're ready to go on that. They're prepared with that. Uh, Aristotle gave us an old word called topoi that said, uh, uh, or I would not say, but it was the word for having that response ready in any particular situation. And the effective public speaker knew what to do if someone walked in right now and said, Oh, Dr. Hahn, this gift is for you. I would know exactly what to say, how to thank them for it, open them, tell them what I was going to do. We won't go all the way with that. But I would know what to do with that. Or if someone came in and said, uh, when you're through with this class, could you come over and give a welcome to the freshman class of students who are here for orientation? And if I were prepared, you know, I could say, sure, no problem. Walk right over and do that. Well, this action assembly theory looks at how we have all of these different options available to us. What kind, what kind of memory we have, what kind of storage we have, how able we are to retrieve these things and use them 
uh, depending on what context we're in. Because we're interested in action outcome units. We're interested in, in what the outcomes are and how we um, produce those outcomes by retrieving information that we need. And in order to participate in conversations in a meaningful way, uh, we have to know the content. We have to know what's being discussed in that particular situation. We also need to know the procedural protocols. Can I interrupt this person? Uh, is this a superior, a subordinate, an equal? Uh, how much can I talk, even if it's someone high ranking above you in the hierarchical structure? Remember systems theory and hierarchy? Oh, and we'll see that again in organizations. You know, uh, how much do I have permission to talk? How much information can I disclose? Can I really express my opinion about this particular thing? So, uh, you know, can I say a cuss word? Well, with this person, maybe so. Uh, on public airways, no. In front of grandma, not a good choice. You know, in front of your parents, well, maybe under severe circumstances, and so on. But all of these are, are protocols, procedural protocols, uh, things that we've learned and use in a particular situation. And uh, the more cognitively complex person, the more experienced person, the more extroverted person is going to have uh, a greater repertoire of those things available to them than will the shy person. Uh, the frequency of use also affects your ability to recollect, to recall, to recollect, as it were, from your brain uh, this information in these action outcome units. Uh, professors experience this with lecture notes. You know, even if you've been lecturing on something for 15 or 20 or 30 years, uh, you usually need to at least take a, the professor usually needs to take a look at those notes and at least review them so they can get it pulled up in, into immediate uh, short-term memory retrieval. Um, even, you know, I know I've got a bunch of notes on classical rhetoric, you know, Aristotle and Plato and Quintilian. I haven't used that stuff in years, and if I were going to lecture on that, I'd need to go uh, check it out because I haven't used it frequently. In fact, I haven't used it in a really long time. And in order to connect the message and the tactic, the content to the goal, uh, frequency plays an important part in being able to get all of that together. And so our memory, our retrieval, all those things. Now you have one little short theory in your workbook. It's just called Social Identity Theory that says people see themselves and others as members of groups. Okay, and, and that's the premise um, it has the status of a law because we do, in fact, do that. And, and we'll see the application of that more when we get finish the interpersonal unit and move into group theory. But it's important to us right now uh, as we're looking at interpersonal because uh, when you talk to someone else, you need to be aware that you're seeing yourself as a member of a variety of groups and that person is identifying also with groups. Whether it's I'm from the state of California, well I'm from Wisconsin, well I'm from Austin, Texas, deep in the heart of Texas. You know, uh, are you a Texan, a Californian, whatever. Are you right-handed or are you left-handed? Uh, that may, you know, sometimes these things are important, sometimes they're not. Perhaps the kind of car that you drive puts you in some sort of group, the kind of sport that you like to play. Uh, there are many, many, many more groups in the world than there are people. Okay, you might have to think about that one for a minute, but it's really true because each one of us comes from demographic groups, you know, their uh, gender and age and interest and geography and socioeconomic income and on and on and on. Uh, each uh, Besides all the things we pay dues to and officially call ourselves members of. So you may belong to anywhere from 50 to several hundred groups if you were actually to take the time and start writing those down and, and thinking about it. 
but we won't go there today, except to recognize that being a part of groups is an important part of who we are. Okay, we're going to turn our attention next to uh, what's called discrepancy arousal. No, we're going to go to speech accommodation. I skipped one here. Okay, um, perhaps you've heard of mirroring behavior where, uh, or you've seen people who, if one's got their hands on their hips, well, the other turns around and gets their hands on their hips, and their body language starts to mimic one another. Well, in order to accommodate one another and, and even get to that point, we have to recognize that in our cognitive processes, and we'll see more of this when we get to Delia and constructivism, uh, that people engage in, they have schemata. Let's see if we can go back here. Uh, we use schemata and we develop these communication plans that we were talking about a minute ago in order to accommodate one another. Uh, the plan may be, for example, uh, you might adapt your plan if you were going to s explain what a cell in the human body is like and what it does. You might have one plan for uh, a high school student and another plan for a first grader. You would adapt your language, you would adapt the depth of the discussion, and so forth. Well, we also have schemata. We have ways that we see the world. And, and we all see the world through our own point of view. You know, even though uh, some people are very good at empathy, some are very good at, at taking the point of view of another person, uh, by and large, most of the time, we see the world from our point of view, and the uh, word for that is ethnocentrism. Um, but we, we do this, and, and through our automated or scripted behavior, competence is measured in, in all of this accommodation by whether or not we achieve our goals and whether or not there's a favorable impression management. Uh, think about how much time you spend trying to manage your impression. Now, sometimes in classes, students don't ma manage their impressions very well. They come in, they look like they just rolled out of bed, and they come in, they put their head down on the table and go to sleep, and uh, that's not a very favorable impression. You know, and certainly if you did that in your workplace, that would be an even less favorable impression. Okay, but you know that if you're going on a job interview, that's, that's probably the time that uh, you all work the hardest in order to make the way you look be really good, uh, the things that you say be really fine. You know, you, oh well, job interviews and dates. Yeah, I, I forgot, it's been a while since I had to worry about that part. Okay, uh, but, but there are those situations meeting the potential in-laws for the first time. There are those situations that are really important to us and so uh, being competent in those situations, not spilling gravy all over your clothes at mealtime, not saying something really stupid that you'll regret for the rest of your life. Uh, even if they forgive you and love you anyway, you'd rather not have, you know, that kind of thing on your record. Because remember we said lecture one, that communication is irreversible. You know, it's ongoing, it's irreversible, uh, when it's live at least. If it's tape, they can go back and, and edit things. But uh, for most of us in interpersonal communication, there are no reruns, there are no retakes. Uh, we're stuck with what we get. And so we want to be competent. We want to do that well. And so we accommodate the other person. We have the schemata, our view of the world. Do you see, when we go way over to mass communication, almost the last lecture, we'll come, <coughs> excuse me, upon a term called mean world syndrome. And, you know, do you see the world as a mean place that's full of crime? Uh, how after the flood in Houston did you see the world? Did you see it as a giant caring community reaching out? Or for those people who spent days on their rooftops with no help, uh, did they see it as uh, a world of, that basically abandons people in need. And they may have seen that for a while and, and then got that perception changed, and, and I certainly hope so. But all of this has to do with how we see the world. Do you see the world uh, in black and white? It's either this way or that way. Or uh, do you see the world in gradations 
of things. And that takes us back to our latitude and attitude and, and social judgment theory. Remember that theory? And I talked with you and, and so did Dr. Williamson about that, that some people have very tight positions on issues and others have considerable latitude in the way that they see those. But all of that has to do with your schemata, uh, whether there's latitude in your position, what your position on various issues is, etc. Okay. Uh, when we accommodate each other with communication patterns, some of the things that you'll often find yourself doing is changing your speech rate. Uh, response latency simply means how long do you wait before you answer? How long is the delay <clears throat> before you respond? Uh, I have a couple of people in my life who are thinkers. And you know, normally when somebody stops talking, it's your turn to talk. And those of us who like to talk a lot jump right in. <clears throat> but if you become aware that, that you have some thinkers <laughs> among your friends, uh, you, you learn, and if you're being accommodating, you wait for those people because they may pause. And they may have a long pause. Uh, they may even pause for a minute or two or three minutes. We won't use up that much air time on this example. You know, but there are some people that pause at great length. And if you're being accommodating, you wait for them. You wait until they drop the inflection in their voice and look at you and give you that official cue that it is indeed your turn. You know, turn duration. How long do you talk when it's your turn? Well, we usually talk about the same length of time that the other person has been talking. So if, if we're having little short exchanges back and forth, both people are likely to do that. Um, or if, if these are long opinions on things, one person may talk for two or three minutes, and the other person will say, well, you know, I don't know, it seems to me, and here they'll go on two or three minutes of things. And, and we just kind of do those things naturally. Um, you may have even been in situations where you found yourself acquiring the accent of the other person. You're talking to someone from Miss, Mississippi or South Carolina, and, and without even thinking about it, you start to stretch the vowels out, and, and then you, mentally you may go, oh, I don't really talk this way, but, but, or if I, I don't mimic New York or Chicago very well, you know, but you may find your voice actually uh, imitating those patterns, okay? And so all, all of those are ways that we adjust uh, what we're doing and mirror the other person's behavior and accommodate uh, that behavior in order to adjust to the situation. So the non-content speech patterns may include things like rate, pitch, volume, pauses, accent, duration, all of those kinds of things. And a, a short word or a short term for the speech convergence phenomenon, which is the official title of it, is mirroring. And that's mimicking the behavior of the other person. And it's actually a useful thing because it improves intelligibility. It's usually easier for two people from Mississippi or Chicago or Jamaica or wherever to understand each other than it is for the mixture to occur. Uh, so it contributes to intelligibility, to smooth interaction, to effective social interaction. Okay, communication repertoires, repertoires and the need for social approval affect this convergence. Okay, uh, the, the greater your repertoire, you know, some of you speak two, three, I think uh, the most, well, I met one woman one time that spoke 14 different languages. Uh, had traveled all, she was from Europe and, you know, just about knew them all. But it's not unusual to find somebody that speaks three or four different languages. Well, it's kind of unusual. A lot of you are bilingual. I'm not. Okay, but anyway, your, your repertoire 
is influenced by how many of those languages you can speak. And the more of those that, that the more languages you can speak, the greater your ability to be accommodating in a particular situation. Now, our social distance is affected by all of this. Our speech maintenance is the term we use for creating social distance and communication, autonomy, independence. Uh, divergence creates disassociation and may occur if it's not cost effective or if it has stigmas associated with it. But all of this has to do with uh, how we maintain our distance with other people. Are we growing closer to them? Are we growing farther apart? Uh, by maintaining these protocols in terms of our uh, speech patterns and so forth, are we maintaining social distance? Are we, for example, uh, uh, using titles and last names? I did some work at an elementary school in Houston for a number of years. And even though the teachers knew each other well, uh, primarily because it was in reference in front of the children, we referred to people by last name and t by title and last name. And, and so that creates a certain degree of social distance there that is dispelled in a situation where you're allowed to use first names. Uh, many of you as students only know your, prof well, it goes both ways. I know professors who, who stick with titles like Dr. Hahn or Dr. Musburger or whatever the case may be. Others will go to shortened forms that are a mix of the formal and the informal. So they become Dr. Bob or Dr. Martha. Uh, the children at the elementary school actually created a title for me called Ms. Dr. Hahn. Uh, because they wanted to set me apart from pediatricians who gave shots. But, you know, they certainly weren't allowed to call me Martha in that context. So they had to use a formal title, but they needed one that uh, accommodated the situation and, like I said, got rid of the medical stigma of giving shots. So uh, all of these things work together uh, in the situation to determine whether that distance is maintained or whether or not uh, we've reduced the distance and created more intimacy. Okay, in discrepancy arousal theory, uh, we recognize, and this is Capella and Green and uh, Judy Burgoon is one of the later researchers who's picked up on this, uh, but they're interested in uh, what happens when people experience discrepancy in what they expect. Okay, we all have expectations about the behaviors and the feelings of other people. You know, uh, I expect my best friend to give me a hug, unless her arms are full of groceries or something. You know, there are exceptions to the rule. There are certain, uh, whenever she sees me, if we haven't seen each other for a while. Or there are certain people that I regularly expect to shake hands with me. There are people that I expect to at least say, hello, how are you? Go through some kind of little uh, ritualistic interaction. And if those people don't do those things, then there's a discrepancy. Okay? When something contrary to what we expect occurs, there's a discrepancy and therefore arousal results. Uh, sometimes it's a big arousal, other times it's just a little, it was, you know, sometimes you could just go, huh, that was odd, you know, maybe they were daydreaming, you write it off. Other times you go, well, what's her problem? What's his problem? Uh, that they're snubbing you or whatever the case may be. That arousal may be either positive or negative, okay? It's, it's not always a negative thing uh, that occurs, but there's usually feeling that's involved in that. You know, certainly if, if you speak to someone and they ignore you, uh, that's going to be a negative discrepancy, that, or a discrepancy that has negative feelings associated with it. And so a violation has occurred of your expectations, and that will negatively affect uh, the interaction and the relationship. At the same time, sometimes it's a positive arousal. Someone that you don't know very well, maybe you ride the elevator uh, together, they work on a different floor in your building, you know, but in, instead of just going, good morning, they look at you and they say, 
Good morning. How are you? It's good to see you today. Nice outfit you're wearing. And your brain goes, well, I didn't expect all of that from this person, you know, or someone you haven't seen for a while at a family reunion that, you know, maybe it's a remote in-law or your third cousin removed or whatever, uh, comes up and gives you a great big hug and, and they just glow. They're so glad to see you. Anyway, there are all kinds of things. Maybe somebody brings you a treat, you know, and, and this little present arrives. Not of great value, but necessarily, but just a little treat, you know. Well, that's a positive arousal and you're, and you're pleased with that. It's a discrepancy in the behavior that you expect. So, um, the, the positive evaluations as well as the negative evaluations can occur. And when the positive evaluations occur, uh, then there will be a convergence that occurs. And often then there's a reciprocity. If, if this person greets you in the elevator and compliments your clothes and engages in conversation, you're likely to say more in return to accommodate them to compensate for that arousal that's taken place. Oh, and, and so you'll amplify on, on what's being said. Okay, we all have interpretive schema. We were using that word schema a while ago. And, and your schema affect the way that you interpret your environment. Uh, these have also been called uh, cognitive templates. Most of you are familiar now with templates, thanks to Microsoft. You know, there's a template for doing your resume. There's a template for uh, doing an invoice. There's a template for a business letter. Uh, you know, templates for all kinds of things. Well, think about that in terms of your cognitive processes. You know, you've got this view of the world, and, and you've got this templates that you overlay. Uh, it may be your family template. It may be, if you're active politically in your political party, there may be a template that relates to that that explains uh, who you see in that portion of your world. Uh, you may have a religious template that has to do with your church and its structure and the people who are there. You know, I have a, a cognitive template about the university in any given semester uh, that will change, of course, you know, depending on how many classes I have and who the students are in those classes and where we're meeting and what kind of objectives we're trying to accomplish. And then you take all of those templates and put them together. You know, my template of, of church and of family and social activities and uh, work and university-related activities. And you get all of that together, and then you have a very sophisticated uh, set of schema. And all of this falls under uh, the umbrella of what Jesse Delia, who's the Dean of Liberal Arts and former Chairman of Speech Communication at the University of Illinois, has called constructivism. It's how we construct our view of the world. And that takes us back to uh, this ethnocentrism notion uh, that we see the world from our own point of view, but we construct it in terms of the schema. And as we were saying a while ago, do you see it as black or white, uh, linear or interactive? Uh, do you see your life as a single path through the woods? And even if you think of the woods, do you think of autumn or do you think of spring and so forth? And it doesn't matter. There's not a right or wrong answer to that. It's just to say that one person will see it one way and another person uh, will see it another way. And, and these depend on the kind of schema that you have and how you see your particular world. Okay, and Delia's done a lot of research uh, in this particular area, uh, measuring how people uh, grad graduate their ratings of things and whether they're black, white, or gradual, you know, whether they're cut and dried and so forth. And he developed what's called a role category questionnaire. And we're not going to go into that at any length today. But i like for you to know when these methodological tools are out there. So if the day comes that you're writing a master's thesis and you need a research tool to, to be useful and help you discover certain things, you know, then uh, that's out there and that's useful to you. And this is, is one of those tools that helps measure the role categories that people find themselves in. Uh, 
It looks at the scores according to differentiation, integration, and then what he ultimately comes up with is a cognitive complexity score. Now, some people are very differentiating. Uh, for example, how many kinds of apples can you name? Red apples and green apples? You know, or can you break those apples down into uh, categories of Rome apples and Washington apples and delicious and you know that may be all I can think of right now. You know, but but there are many many kinds of apples out there. Well, the person with high differentiation skills can can differentiate a number of distinct categories to describe uh, with the questionnaire. It involves the personality of the individual, but at a broader level, it's a differentiation across a variety of contexts. Uh, can you abstract the ability to see and identify visible behaviors in terms of motives, internal traits, individual dispositions? Can you tell when someone's pulling a prank on you? Can you tell if someone's enga engaging in game playing with you? Can you back off and see these things? Or you know, do you see the forest or do you see the trees? Well, the person who sees the trees is the high differentiation person and the person who is more in the abstraction end of the continuum is the person who's going to see the forest rather than the trees. Uh, and integration is an important dimension of this because this is the ability to recognize and reconcile impressions that are in conflict. For example, if you have a person who is often very, very punctual, but at other times they're late. Well, well, what does that mean? You know, how do you explain their behavior in terms of those discrepancies? Sometimes they're really friendly to you, and other times they're just almost hostile. Well, why do people act that way? Well, you you know, you have to you have to know the person, you have to know the factors in the situation. Sometimes I can explain it. Uh, I have one acquaintance that gets headaches a lot, and I think there's a correlation between the headaches and the hostile behavior. You know, if this person doesn't feel well, then they just kind of close up and go their, their own way. But that's my attempt at integration, and I don't really know. You know. And sometimes I think, well, maybe this person just likes me better on Tuesday and Thursday than they do on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. In that case, I'm not doing a good job of integrating. I'm just kind of playing around with possible explanations. For things, but anyway, but particularly if you've got someone, maybe they're a really good worker part of the time, and then other times they're not so responsible. You've got someone who's late, punctual. You know, they're really discrepant behaviors there. Uh, so anyway, it's our ability to integrate that helps account for and, and take into account those different uh, behaviors, so that we can say, well, by differentiating this and integrating that I, I can start to understand that here's the explanation uh, for the total picture. Now message design logic uh, ties into how we use all of this and it's a little bit similar to Green's action assembly model but it's looking at how do we develop the ability to be competent in certain situations. Well we develop these communication plans that we were talking about earlier and these are competency acts for these different situations, whether it's interpersonal or organizational or even in a mass-mediated situation. Uh, we, we have to have competency acts and our ability to plan affects the way that, that we engage in those and what the outcomes are. And uh, message design, design logic says that, that these messages fall into three broad categories, expressive, conventional, and rhetorical. And expressive messages are kind of like emotional dumps. You know, have you ever had, I'm sure you have, have somebody come and say, oh, let me tell you what just happened to me. And whoa, here they go. And they don't ask, do you have time to talk? Do you have time to listen to this? It's just really important to get it out. Maybe they're angry at someone on the telephone, uh, maybe there was an incident on the freeway, well, you know, all kinds of things set us off. But when we need to ventilate, when we need to get those ideas out, 
and so forth. Well, this is expressive communication. And sometimes all we have to do is tell one person or tell two or three people and just be really agitated and angry and mad and then, okay, we're done. You know, that, that got it out and it's a done deal. Okay, conventional messages uh, are the thing, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, doing all the things we've talked about already with the rules and, and the conventions of taking turns and uh, the responsibilities that we have for message flow within organization or within groups or whatever the the case may be. Just the, the average day-to-day -day stuff, uh, we just kind of lump over there in the conventional category. And then remember when we talked about Aristotle, who centuries ago gave us that definition that rhetoric is the art or ability in any given situation to find the available means of persuasion. Well, picking up on that, O'Keefe says that rhetorical message messages are those design logic tactics that we use to convey impressions and to influence interaction outcomes. Communicators cooperatively construct their own social realities. But in our rhetorical messages, we are creating the message, and it all gets back tied into communication plan. Okay, how can you best construct the message to get your parents to give you the money, the keys to the car, whatever? How can the professor best construct the message so that the lecture is clear, so that the students understand it, so that the applications are meaningful, etc.? And when we use those available means that we have, then we're engaging in what's called this rhetorical process because it's a creative process. Okay, in some cases it's a fine art to create messages in such a way that, that they marvelously impart information or they brilliantly persuade an audience uh, to do a particular thing. So messages fall in those three categories, expressive, conventional, and rhetorical. And, and just think about the name of the title, Message Design Logic. Uh, there's a logic behind the design of the messages. And various messages may be equally effective. Okay, There's not just one way to do things. And, and as we get into compliance gaining strategies, we'll look at, at some of the options that we all have in the strategies that we use with other people. Uh, our goal structure may be very simple or it may be very complex. And it, and it ties back into the person's beliefs and their choices and, and all of that's tied into what they do in terms of choices to accomplish these goals. And there's often more than one way uh, to get there. And particularly when you're engaged in that rhetorical process, um, the rhetorical process means taking a look at all those options that you have available to you. And when you put all of this together, um, the theorists tell us that th there's a concept that they've labeled cognitive complexity. And it's not a personality trait. Okay? It's, it's an ability of your brain to do certain things. It's a mindful activity that involves the scripted behavior. Uh, it involves planning in relation to the specific issues, the goals, the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. And the whole process is affected by this cognitive complexity, your ability to differentiate, your ability to integrate, uh, to do those different things that Delia was talking about. Okay, uh, we're going to look briefly at uh, some stages in relational development and stages of relational dissolution, and uh, then we'll make some applications of those through a couple of other uh, PowerPoint presentations. Mark Knapp, who's over at the University of Texas, has told us that people when they're in a developing relationship, go through five basic stages. And you'll see some books that just have four stages and drop the integration. The integration is kind of the blend between intensification and bonding. But there's the initiation stage where people, that demographic exchange of information, uh, where people initially come together. There's an experimentation phase 
in which uh, we kind of try things out. You know, we admit certain foods we don't like or certain ball teams we do or don't like. Things, things get a little riskier in that phase. Uh, there may be even some nonverbal experimentation. He or she moves a little closer on the sofa and, you know, does the person stay there or do they get up and move too? Or, you, you know, you try to kiss goodnight and the other person reciprocates or not. The experimentation may be verbal and sharing of beliefs. It may be nonverbal in those kinds of behaviors, and we've already talked about uh, nonverbal communication. Intensification, though, things are getting lots more interesting, lots more interaction, lots more sharing of information, and probably a lot more nonverbal interaction at that level too. At integration you're getting even a better fit until finally at the bonding stage uh, there may be marriage, the person may become a partner in the law firm, at the university uh, the individual uh, uh, gets tenure you know, and plans to stay for life. Uh, you're really bonded at that particular point. Okay, but not all, as we know, not all relationships uh, last forever. Uh, many of them do not. And so Stephen Duck, who's up at Iowa, has given us some stages for relational dissolution. And he says the first thing that happens is an intrapsychic phase. An intra, remember, is inside your head. At that intrapsychic phase, let me just get those up there. There are four phases. Intrapsychic, uh, that little voice is going off in your head maybe that says, what am I doing here? Why did I take this job? Uh, some of you have heard me tell the story of, of my daughter who, the youngest daughter, took a uh, job as a fax machine operator. And the first day, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and not just operator, but monitor. She was in charge of the fax machine. And this was a big international company that had uh, faxes that came in from all over the world. Now, sometimes there'd be 100 pages from Tokyo or 50 pages from Toronto. And when something like that came in, it was very important to make sure all those pages were there, get them in the right order, and immediately get them to whatever executive officer uh, was supposed to have the information. But then there were hours and hours where nothing occurred on the fax machine. Okay? And you just had to wait. And there was no desk, because if you're an op a fax machine operator, you know, you're not entitled to a desk. That's not a high enough status position within the organization. So she just had to wait. She couldn't read a book, uh, because that looked unprofessional. And this was one of those complexes with lots of glass walls and distinguished international visitors who took tours and so forth. And, and to see an employee sitting over there, uh, reading a novel or a comic book or something, you know, would have been too unprofessional. So it turned out to be a very boring kind of job, and it, and it only took a day for that little intrapsychic voice to say, what's going on here? I think I've made a mistake. Sometimes it's 30 years of marriage or 25 years of employment with an organization uh, before that voice goes off and that sort of thing happens. Okay. Uh, when it does, it may be a very short time until that information goes public. Or it may be a long time. You know, some people walk around for years knowing that they're in a dead-end job or an unpleasant relationship, but they don't want to go through the confrontation that's necessary in order to offset that and deal with it. So... They don't. But anyway, at some point, if the relationship's going to dissolve, and sometimes it doesn't, sometimes your voice just talks to you and there's a stop to it and it's not a very healthy relationship, but it, it doesn't dissolve. But if it's moving toward dissolving, then uh, the second phase is what we call dyadic. And remember, a dyad is two persons. And so at the dyadic level, uh, you may go to the other individual and say, I've got a problem, or I'm concerned about. Uh, sometimes you go to the person that you have the problem with, or other times you go to a, maybe a friend or a counselor or someone and talk to them and say, I have these concerns, I have these reservations, uh, this is what the little voice in my head is telling me, and so I'm not sure what I'm going to do, and I would welcome your input 
on this? You know, what, what do you think about this? Should I get a divorce? Should I quit the job? That sort of thing. Okay, at the social level, it's moving then up to a third level or the next level. And this is where it's beyond just you and someone else. Uh, you may start to give cues out to your family that the relationship is in trouble, that you're thinking about giving the engagement ring back. Or he may start letting his relatives know that he's thinking about calling the wedding off and going to ask for the ring back. Or uh, one employee may make it known to the other people around them that they're looking for a job somewhere else. And, and all of the, whatever that happens, then you've moved to the social level. At the grave dressing level, there's actually been a termination of the relationship. The person has quit or the divorce has occurred. You know, that final stage is there. It's called grave dressing because just like you put grave markers up out at the cemetery that have labels on them, you know, here lie so-and-so, rest in peace, or devoted father, beloved mother, whatever. There's always a public story that one needs to tell when a relationship dies. And you have to decide what that story is going to be, okay? Or are you going to say, well, we just had incompatible differences, uh, you know, and we decide we'd just be happier if we went our separate ways. Or are you going to tell, you know, really rotten, dirty stories on the other person and badmouth them for the rest of your life? All of those are types of things that uh, go on. We're going to go to a different uh, visual here in just a minute. Uh, all of these are kinds of things that go on. Um, can do two things at once. Anyway, uh, the stories that we tell people to account for uh, what's happened. Okay, we're going to look at a couple of applications now of, uh, and this is a, a cute little sequence. I think you'll enjoy this. The one of my students last semester put together, Jennifer put this together and, and created this hypothetical couple. And they're going to have a little romance here and develop a relationship. Okay, now remember our, four st our five stages were initiating, experimenting, intensifying, integrating, and bonding. And so here comes the fellow in the scene. This is Jack. He's in his 20s, tall, blonde, you know, good looking, all the right stuff. And Jack, of course, who would he meet? Jill. And here's Jill, you know, according to Jennifer. Jill is short, blonde, blue-eyed, artistic, smart, friendly, the perfect the perfect female for Jack. Okay, and so, you know, in the beginning, what's going to happen? We're going to have that first stage. They meet at a party. They're at a mutual friend's house. They're not even aware of each other when they first show up. Uh, but then they see each other from across the room. One smiles at the other. You know, eye contact is made. And so then they move into that initiation phase. But they're going to be careful. They're going to check each other out. Uh, look each other over to see if they're both attractive enough, uh, whether that's physical attractiveness or internal attractiveness, whatever you're interested in when you make that initial contact. And so it'll start with something like, hi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? And that's that initial phase. Okay, well, then as we said, the, the relationship moves to the experimenting or experimentation phase. Uh, they exchange names, they'll share in small talk, uh, they'll seem interested in each other, and so they'll share in more topics, more information about those topics. And in this case, because we've got to get them uh, connected here pretty quickly, uh, it's like lightning strikes, and you know they're just the perfect match for each other, and they just realize that with, within a very short period of time. And so very quickly, and you hear these people go to, Meet somebody in Vegas and 24 hours they're later they're married or something like that. Well, that, this couple's almost that intense. So, but anyway, they go out on a date. They quickly become good friends and soon they're holding hands, using nicknames, sharing secrets uh, with one another. Okay, they're, they're quickly moving toward the stage of integration. And after a while, they just seem fused. And, and perhaps you've had people in your life that... Uh, or, or you know people 
that even if they're not married, they're, they function as one. You don't, you don't visualize one without the other. You, you think of them as Billy and Fulton or Jean and Camille or Ginger and Bob or whatever. Uh, they're pairs. And, and in this case, the couple is thinking of themselves in that same sort of way. Uh, lots of similarities in their attitudes, in the behavior, in their dress, all of these kinds of things. And so they're doing lots of things together, even though they have their separate and individual personality characteristics uh, they are they are doing these things, lots of stuff together. And so, as you might expect, uh, we're going to get to the bonding phase here. And in this case, the, it's wedding bells. What else would you expect? Whoops, that went by faster than it was supposed to. Let's go back there. Okay. So anyway, he asked her to marry him. Uh, you know, they announced their engagement. They go through all the protocols and so forth. Uh, but on, on your wedding day, of course, that's one of those places that you vow that future commitment, which you hope will last a lifetime. So whether it's becoming a partner in the law firm, tenure at the university, or wedding bells, bonding is that stage where things are really locked in. Of course, now, let's take a quick look, and they even have children, see? <laughs> Got some haircuts, too. Okay. Uh, I think we've got enough time here. Let's see what happens after they've been married for a while. Okay, And remembering those stages from Duck of relational dissolution, <clears throat> we had intrapsychic, dyadic, social, and grave dressing. And you can probably tell at this point that the end is not going to be a happy one. Okay? And so here comes our uh, couple. Well, first we need to know, and these are listed in your workbook, and we'll come back to these more when we uh, do some more interpersonal. But you'll see in your study guide a number of strategies for disengagement. And I don't want to talk about those at this point. I just want to follow through with Jack and Jill. So we'll get back to these. Uh, you'll also see in your study guide, and we'll come to in a future interpersonal lecture, the compliance gaining strategies. But at this point of bonding, they're using compliance gaining strategies on each other. Uh, they're, they're engaging in all sorts of interpersonal uh, communication activities. <clears throat> By this time, though, just to follow our couple through to conclusion here in, in today's lecture, uh, Jack has become a father. So he's not quite the same person he used to be. He's a businessman. He's a hard worker. He's stressed, you know, got to support that family and be yuppies and all that sort of thing. And Jill has become a mother. So she's a homemaker. She's a stay-home mom. But she's busy and she's tired. Well, if you've had my crisis communication class, you know that being stressed and busy and tired, these are not good ingredients. <laughs> for a successful marriage. So anyway, um, we've got some children here just to get a little profile on them. There's a boy. John is young. He's mischievous. He's curious. Uh, there's a daughter, and she's young, and she's smart, and she's creative. And those kind of children will keep their parents really busy. Uh, and so in the beginning, you know, this was a happy couple. They did whatever it took to make things work. They found time for each other. Uh, even though they had busy schedules, uh, they were working at this, and they were so much in love that, you know, they would do almost anything for each other. They were doing everything they could. But eventually, over time, the promises got broken. Jack uh, fell in debt with his family because, it, you know, he was working late. Uh, he would promised to be home for dinner, and he wouldn't show up. Um, or he'd tell Jane, I'm sorry I didn't make it to your play at school, but I promise I'll be there the next time. And so the situation is such that Jack's starting to work late at the office. They're not having enough time uh, with each other. Jill is starting to make threats about his coming home late. Uh, he's starting to accuse her of having an affair. I, you can make up whatever little scenario uh, you want here. You know, but this, this relationship is in trouble, and it's certainly not the same relationship uh, that it was back there several slides back when the wedding bells uh, were in the air. 
So there's no trust, there's no time, and eventually they reach a point where there's no love anymore. Jack is busy at work with deadlines. He's got clients, he's got problems. At home, he's got the stress of children and bills and expenses, and he's wondering if Jill's having an affair on the side. Jill's at home cooking and cleaning and doing all the chores and trying to juggle PTA and homework and projects and, and do her part on the bills and the expenses too. And so it, you can see that we're getting into a situation here that we've really uh, got a dysfunctional family uh, at work in this situation. So at the intrapsychic phase, all of a sudden the little bell goes off in Jill's head. She's fed up with Jack being jealous, and she starts to withdraw. Uh, I can, just can't stand this anymore. You know, that's one of those little mental cues that there's something wrong here. Uh, and each of them is constantly thinking about the negative aspects of the relationship rather than the positive side of the relationship. She's saying things like, he never admits that he's wrong. You know, um, he regrets not having her sign a prenuptial agreement, so she can't get half of all that money he's worked so hard for since she obviously isn't entitled to it if she's just a housewife. Uh, she never forgives and forgets. You know, they're, they're both collecting stuff on each other. And so um, she goes to her friend Susan and says, would I be better off if I got a divorce? You know, and Susan is saying, I can't believe you're at the point you want a divorce. Uh, but, but anyway, she's dyadic. She's gone beyond herself. She's looking uh, for someone else, and she decides that she does. She's looking for someone else to tell her what to do, and she decides she does want a divorce. So she's moved uh, from the dyadic stage. Uh, she goes to Jack and actually asks for the divorce. Uh, in this case, they have a state of the relationship talk, and uh, we'll talk about that more later on, too. But they decide that the best thing for them to do is to separate. Okay, well, at the social phase, you have to, you know, friends are going to find out. Jack moves out of the house. And so they have to say something to their friends. Uh, Jill may say something like, Jack and I have talked it over, and we've decided that, you know, we should separate for a while, and this is a mutual thing. But he moves out. He still visits the children. Uh, they both have to figure out what they're going to tell their friends. And they're agreeing to alternate weekends with the kids and that sort of thing. Ultimately, they're going to move to the grave dressing phase, and that's where all of his stuff is permanently out. Uh, their lives have changed drastically. They're no longer the people we met several minutes ago. Uh, Gene, uh, pardon me, Jack, has to learn how to cook because he's out on his own now. Uh, he's got to clean his own apartment or wherever he moved to. He's basically got to learn to take care of himself, do his own laundry, take his shirts to the cleaners, those kinds of things. Jill, on the other hand, has to support the family. Uh, she gets a job. Uh, she has to learn how to manage the life of a working mother. And so that's a real jolt to her personal system and goals, too. They both have to create versions of why they got divorced. They have to find something to tell their friends in this particular situation. And so Jill's response is, he worked so much we never had time for each other. Jack's position was, she was never supportive of anything that I did. Now maybe those things are true, maybe they're not, maybe they're distortions of reality, but these are the stories <clears throat> that they chose to tell the people around them. So in conclusion, we see that according to, to um, NAP, there are those five stages in which relationships come together, and then Duck gives us four stages of relational dissolution. In our next lecture, we'll go more into depth about the type of relationship disengagement strategies that we just briefly had listed on this slide and on one of the slides in this presentation. And we'll look in more detail at the compliance gaining strategies. Uh, in the next lecture, too, we'll be looking at attribution theory, uh, functions of family, interpersonal perception, and how those different dimensions come into play. I thank you for your attention.